Hi, I'm Nakia Smithers, Essence Magazine best-selling author, X Magazine Publisher of the Year, and the president of the award-winning Readers with Attitudes Book Club. Today I'd like to share with you a few excerpts from my books Gold Digging, Key Story, Attitudes of a Woman, and Sweet Dreams. I hope that you'll enjoy. The next excerpt that I'm going to read to you is coming from my book Sweet Dreams. Sweet Dreams was a book that is most recently released by me and is the book that was featured in October 2008 Essence Magazine for the number four best-selling paperback fiction book. All my life I had been witness to my mother's lack of motivation. She used me for a check and free rent. Food stamps were our way of life not because she didn't have any other way but because she was unmotivated to get a job. Instead, she loved to hustle here and there, drinking and partying like she was 16 years old. Look at you over there looking like your daddy. I should have aborted you when I got pregnant, but the only thing that you are good for is a check, taxes, and them damn dishes. Her words were hurtful, but I continued to block them out of my mind. I started to sing to myself, Mary J's song, No More Drama. Only for me, the drama would never end. But the song gave me hope that there would be a change coming soon. I longed for school and work. Those were the times that I could be away from my mother and could truly clear my mind away from the mess. Unfortunately, it was a Friday night and school was two days away. I had to work on Saturday, but it would only be a short day at the hair salon. I was in the midst of thinking what else I could do to get away from my mother and her craziness. The siren from the phone ringing pierced through the chaos of our home. Get the phone, little girl. It ain't for nobody but you anyway. I'm going to cut that thing off, you know. Keep testing me. I tried hard not to roll my eyes at her as I went to answer the phone. Respecting her was hard to do, which regardless of her actions was necessary because she was my mother in the end. Dream? A woman was half weeping on the other end of the line. I recognized her voice faintly. Miss Dawkins? Dream. She wailed my name like it was causing her pain. My heart sank right then. I knew that if she was calling me, then there was something wrong. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to comfort her. The pain in her voice was evident. She was my best friend, Adrian's mother. My baby's gone. She wept through the phone line. Now, that puzzled me because... To my knowledge, Adrian and her mother had never been that close. This was the main reason that Adrian and I were so tight. I questioned as how to Miss Dawkins could claim such closeness now. Her next words cemented me to the floor. I felt as though I would fall out from the duress. Miss Dawkins, what are you saying? Adrian killed herself, she cried. What? That couldn't be. Adrian was my only refuge for years. We had met in junior high school and were inseparable since then. She shot herself with David's gun. There's a letter here that she wrote to you, and the police are asking you to come and get it. They won't let me read it because it's addressed to you. I should be able to read it. I'm her mother, she screamed into the phone. And in panic, I spoke. Okay, I, I'm coming over. Give me about 20 minutes. I threw the phone down in his cradle, rushing into my room to grab my belongings and some change for the bus before running out the door. My mother screamed behind me, what's going on? I left her question unanswered. I couldn't deal with her just then. I couldn't ask her for a ride. She didn't own a car. It wasn't uncommon in Bridgeport for people to go their whole lives without driving, but the transit system was everywhere. Tears were streaming down my face like a free falling waterfall. My heart was beating against my chest so hard I could feel every pump. There had to be a mistake. My best friend could not have been dead. No, this wasn't happening. Keith's story is a follow-up to Gold Digging. Many of my readers read Gold Digging and wanted to know more about Keith and what had he had been through from the time that he had a traumatic situation when he was seven until he grew to be 27 and met Goldie. So Keith's story is written in two parts. The first part serves as a prequel to Gold Digging and answers all the questions that happened in his youth. While the second part tells the continued story of Goldie and Keith, will their love last or will they have to 
battle the skeletons that come tumbling out of the past. After about 10 minutes of running, I found myself in a housing project called Widow's Manor on the other side of the hill from where Cardboard City lay. I felt it was okay for me to finally slow down and catch my breath. I walked into one of the alleyways behind the back of two buildings, looking for a vacant spot where I could lay my head. I was tired of running, but I knew that the journey was just beginning. Then reality kicked in. I was truly homeless. I couldn't go back to the rubble that once was my home. I didn't know where my mother was, or how to contact her, or even where my extended family might have been. They might as well have not even existed. The sounds of the night settled restlessly around me as I sat against a huge dumpster and rested my head backwards. In the far distance, I could see two figures intertwined in a compromising position. One person was on their knees. The guy who was standing straight up leaned his head back. His hands were on top of the woman's head, guiding her head in a rhythmic motion. Finally, I could recognize the figure. It was my mother. Was this the way that she made her money? Was this how she supported Rock's habit? So this was the reason that she had left me alone, unaware that a fire had broken out and left us both homeless. I couldn't take my eyes off the scene, astonished that she was sitting there pleasuring the man for money. Finally, she relieved herself from the spot on the ground where she sat. He pulled out a stack of bills and peeled off several and placed them in her hand. She simply winked at him before walking off. After about 11 steps, her eyes refocused to see me there with my knees clasped to my chin, looking at her pitifully. What are you doing here, she said. Her look was more out of disgust than concern. Well, there's a fire at our house. The building burnt down and a lady from the Red Cross was questioning me since I was alone and now we're homeless. When she walked over to the police, I just went ahead and ran because I didn't want her to put me in a foster home. The words seemed to peel off my tongue like somebody laid them there freely. My mother looked at me trying to digest the words. I didn't move. There was no need to. Not even when she walked away from me, leaving me there alone, still homeless and now motherless. That was the last time that I saw her. That day changed my life forever. I started to call out to her, but changed my mind. What was the use? What sense would it make? She had left me there like I never even mattered to her. Never looking back, she continued to walk with her head held up like she was confident that she had made a conscious decision. It was like I had just given her the okay to walk away from it all. The life that she never wanted, the son that she never wanted. She didn't turn around to see if I was following her and I didn't want to. T if she wanted to leave me, I'm Nakia Smithers, okay. and I hope that you enjoyed. You can visit me on my website, which is www.nakiasmithers.com. My books can be purchased there, Amazon.com, keyword Nakia, or also with Precious Memories Bookstore in Richmond, Virginia. Have a wonderful day, and let me know how you like my books. You can visit me on my website, which is NakiaSmithers.com. That's N-I-K-K-E-S. <laughs> you know, sip water. <laughs> These lights is like. <laughs>